Uh, I want to welcome you all. Thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, thank you to Sandra Dunn at OLA for helping to put all this together. My name is Minerva Perez, and I am the executive director of OLA of Eastern Long Island. Anna Kessler is here. She's going to be uh, simultaneously interpreting everything for us. She uh, works for the court. She's a professional and amazing woman. She's also a board member of OLA. So I have to remember to slow down occasionally. <laughs> um, so uh, OLA of Eastern Long Island was founded in 2002 as a 501c3 nonprofit committed to promoting social and economic, cultural, educational, the microphone. I'm supposed to be using this. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, okay. Thought my theater voice was doing it. I completely forgot. Sorry about that. Um, is that good? Do I have to start again or are we good? We're good? Okay. So Ola of Eastern Long Island was founded in 2002 as a nonprofit committed to promoting the social, economic, cultural, educational development of Long Island's East End Latino communities through its own programming initiatives and also ongoing local collaborations. OLA strives to empower, inform, and celebrate our many Latino cultures while building bridges within the larger East End community that help to foster understanding and harmony. Again, I want to let everyone know that this event is going to be broadcast at a later date. It is being televised, and only the panel is being televised. Why we are here tonight is to first present information on federally mandated changes to New York State driver's license in order to be real ID compliant. That's going to be that 2020 real ID. And then to discuss the need for all drivers to be allowed to drive lawfully by being eligible for driver's licenses regardless of immigration status. We've got a slide up here. Um, OLA is part of a statewide coalition, Greenlight New York. Okay. that is working to restore access to driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants. We're going to start things off with a short presentation and then a panel discussion, and then we'll close with questions from the audience. Index cards have been handed out uh, for you to write your questions on, and then when you're completed your question, please hold them up, and John or uh, someone else that's helping us out today is going to pick up your card uh, and make sure that they go to Sandra. Everything is simultaneously interpreted uh, with Anna Kessler. Uh, and not only is that going to be available to the folks that are here in the audience, but at a later date, this broadcast is going to show up on LTV and other places uh, with Spanish overlaid so that everyone in our community, English and Spanish speaking, uh, will be able to understand what we're talking about today. I want to have a big thank you for our co-sponsors, Progressive East End Reformers, PEER, Neighbors in Support of Immigrants, NISI, and Centro Corazón de Maria, and the North Fork Unity Action Committee. A big thank you to Hampton Coffee Company for our setup back there, and also to the wonderful staff at LTV Studios. And Eric, uh, thank you all. Um, I do want to say one thing quickly, is that uh, Ola is not involved in this green light campaign, uh, just sort of jumping on the bandwagon. It's a very important campaign, but Ola for the last three years on the East End has been focused on the needs specifically around transportation for our community members and, and most of all our vulnerable community members. Um, and we've been seeing uh, the need grow and we've been seeing it as a, a, a stronger focus that we have to put on what's happening and we, we thank Fred Thiel for all the work that he's doing with commuter and last mile. Uh, we're working at the county level, the state level, and the town and village level to improve access to public transportation uh, in addition to the focus that we have right now in Greenlight New York and driver's licenses. So I just want to assure you all that this is something that OLA, this is an organic extension of OLA's work, uh, and that's why we're very happy to have this dialogue and host this forum with our co-sponsors because it's that important for our communities right here. Uh, this is a focus that's a local focus for us. That's what OLA's focus is, the east end of Long Island, and that's why we've gathered these speakers together. And now I want to introduce you to Sandra. Sandra Dunn uh, began as OLA's uh, associate Director in September 2018, after almost 10 years uh, at the Hagedorn Foundation, uh, where she managed the grant making in the local immigration and civic engagement programs that they funded. So right now I want to introduce you to Sandra Dunn. Thank you all again for being here. Thank you. Such a pleasure to be here to talk about this important topic with you tonight and to see so many people in the audience. Thank you for being here. 
So the first part, this it's a PowerPoint and it's mostly visual, don't worry, and it's very short. So it's a separate issue in a way from the issue we'll be talking about tonight, which is restoring access to driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants. It's a separate issue that I'll be talking about here, which is real ID compliance. I wager that most people in the audience probably do not know what real ID compliance is, so we're just going to go over it very quickly before we plunge into the discussion about restoring access to driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants. So let's see if this is going to work. Yay. Real ID compliance in New York. So the Real ID Act was passed by Congress in 2005, so a long time ago, and it's scheduled to be fully implemented by all states by October 2020. So the federal act that mandated this um, establishing minimum security standards for state-issued driver's licenses permits and ID cards, and this is so that the cards can be used for any federal purposes, including for use with the TSA, the Transportation Security Administration, to board a plane. So that's what the federal act, the Real ID Act, passed by Congress in 2005, stipulated, that there would be these minimum security standards. New York State announced its plan for Real ID compliance in 2017. And so this plan includes a, a three-tiered system, three different kinds of driver's licenses that we can all have access to, most of us anyway. And that's what we will discuss tonight. So in order to be Real ID compliant, um, there is an, a Real ID license, the one in the middle, that can be used for federal purposes. We'll go into detail in a little bit. There's the top one, an enhanced license for federal use. And then there is the, the last one, the standard license, which is not for federal use. So let's go into a little bit of detail, just so it's clear. So here you see above the, the three options. The enhanced license, which will have an American flag in the right bottom corner. The middle license, which is the Real ID license although the enhanced license also counts as a real ID license. It is real ID compliant, it's just enhanced. And the middle license has a star at the top, and then the standard license has printed at the top, not for federal purposes. So the top two can be used for federal purposes, boarding a plane for a domestic flight, or um, entering certain most federal buildings and, uh, and it's acceptable, of course, for photo identification purposes. The difference between the enhanced license at the top and the real ID license in the middle is that with the enhanced license, besides boarding a flight, a domestic flight, entering a federal, a federal building or a military base, you can also cross a US border coming from Canada, Mexico, and some Caribbean countries. Okay, so if you want to travel to Canada, you will not need to take your passport. You will be able to, if you have the enhanced license. Okay? With the real ID license, you can board a plane for a domestic flight, but you will not be able to cross that border in, into Canada without a passport. The standard license is not for federal purposes. And there will be a standard license, there will be a standard driving permit, and um, a a non-driver ID card as well. So to board a domestic flight, we can use, for example, my license is very, very old. It doesn't look anything like this, um, but it's considered today's version of a standard license. When I renew at, at, towards the end of this year, I will have to get, if I choose a standard license, I will have to get a standard license that look like, looks like this. Or I can choose a real ID, or I can choose an enhanced license. So most of us, um, anybody who is a U.S. citizen, has access to any of these three licenses. It's your choice. The difference, another big difference between enhanced and real ID is, and, and the standard is that the two bottom licenses, do, you won't have to pay extra for it, just the normal transaction fees, whatever those might be. For the enhanced license, you will need to pay an extra $30 for the privilege of being able to um, um, have that extra uh, ability to cross a border into Mexico or Canada. Okay, so again, for federal purposes, and you must show that you 
um, you are lawfully present in the United States for the top two, actually for, for any of these. And we're going to be speaking about uh, restoring access to driver's licenses for the standard license, not for federal purposes, uh, only for identification purposes and, and state purposes, restoring the standard license, access to standard license to undocumented um, immigrants. So this is the standard license, the one we'll be talking about tonight. There is legislation in the Assembly and in the, in the Senate of New York State. And for this reason, uh, Fred Thiel is here with us, Assemblyman Fred Thiel. And legislation is pending that is called the Driver's License Access and Privacy Act. This legislation in the Assembly and, and the Senate, and it's the same bill in each house of the legislature, of the state, this legislation would restore access to, uh, to driver's licenses to only this license, the standard license for undocumented immigrants in New York State who are residents and, and show proof of residency in New York State. So we at OLA obviously support this. Uh, we hope by the end of the evening you will also support it if you don't already. And if you do, we want to make sure that you have available here uh, the number of the Senate Majority Leader, Andrea Stewart-Cousins, and the Speaker of the Assembly, Carl Hastie. There are the, those numbers. It's very important that we reach out to those elected officials, uh, uh, further west especially, to get the votes needed in the Senate. Long Island senators are key. We have senators further west uh, that that we really hope will, will come on board with this. Here in our district, thankfully, we have Fred Thiel, who is a co-sponsor in the assembly of this bill. So um, we're asking that everybody reach out to Andrea Stewart-Cousins and to Carl Hasty to let them know that you support this, if indeed you do. And also here locally, Ola has submitted uh, draft resolutions to East Hampton Town, and Southampton Town to ask them to support this legislation publicly. So that's in the works, and we would like for you to also reach out to your local East Hampton and Southampton Town Board members and say that you want them to support the, the legislation at the state level, the Driver's License Access and Privacy Act. Um, it's great if they support things in concept, but what we really want to see is them supporting the legislation. And then for any questions uh, after this forum, if you want to give Ola a call to see how you can get involved, we would greatly appreciate that. So I'm going to put it back on here so you can get those numbers down. And now I'm going to scoot over to there and we can start our conversation. Once again, welcome to all of you, to our speakers. It's a great honor to have you all here with us, and thank you again to all of you for coming. So I'm going to start with inter brief introductions of everybody, and then we'll get the conversation started. Uh, I'll start with Minerva Perez, who has been OLA's executive director since 2016, and she's been involved with OLA as a volunteer or in um, other capacities since the mid-2000s. Sandra Gonzalez immigrated to the United States from Mexico in 1998. She's an East Hampton resident and has been in East Hampton for 21 years. She works at Capelli Hair Salon in Bridgehampton. And since 2008, she's um, been working at the retreat shelter as the overnight senior shift worker. Dr. Gail Schoenfeld is an East Hampton pediatrician who established East End Pediatrics 35 years ago in 1982. East End Pediatrics was founded as a healthcare facility to serve all community members, regardless of their ability to pay. Assemblyman Fred Thiel has represented our district, Assembly District 1, which stretches from Montauk to the easternmost part of Brookhaven Town. He's represented us since 1995. He is a lifelong resident of Sag Harbor. Uh, and he participates on several committees in, in the Assembly, including the Transportation Committee, which is where the bills in the Senate and the Assembly are at the moment. They've not been brought to the floor for a vote. 
And finally, last but not least, we have Barbara Layton, who is the owner of Babette's in East Hampton, Babette's Restaurant, which opened 24 years ago in 1995. It was the first restaurant of its kind to focus on organic, farm-to-table cuisine, along with a full juice bar and a liquor bar. So thank you again for being here, and we will get started. And I'm just going to ask all the speakers, again, to keep in mind that Anna Kessler is interpreting, and if I go fast, please let me know, and I'll let you know. Um, and please pick up the mic uh, to start. Fred, the first question is going to be for, for you. So, Assemblyman Thiel, if you could please give some history or background on why we're talking about restoring access to driver's licenses for the undocumented in New York State. Our state used to allow undocumented immigrants to drive lawfully with driver's licenses. When and why was that access taken away? Sure, and the key word is restore. Um, you know, I think most people have the sense of this issue that this has been a long time prohibition that uh, undocumented uh, immigrants had no ability to get driver's license in this state and it's been a long time policy. That is not the case. Um, up until 2002, uh, there was no uh, citizenship requirement for being here legally or in, uh, with, uh, with some sort of documentation, green card, etc. until 2002. Before that, uh, if you were undocumented, you were able to get a driver's license. Um, in the aftermath of 9-11, uh, the governor, then Governor Pataki, issued an executive order uh, to the Department of Motor Vehicles that uh, basically outlawed the DMV from issuing licenses except to anybody who was here either as a citizen or with documentation. The purpose of that executive order in those days after 9-11 was to make sure that potential terrorists couldn't get a driver's license in the state of New York. Thank you. And what does the pending legislation now in the Transportation Committee in, in both chambers of the New York State Legislature, what does it provide for? What does it do? Well, it, it, to, to, without getting into the, all the details of a, of a multi-page bill, uh, and following what uh, your presentation on the three different, the multi-tier licenses, the three different tiers, uh, the standard license, in essence what this bill would do, would, would allow uh, undocumented immigrants to be able to uh, get a, a standard license. Of course, they, as you mentioned, would have to be a resident of the state of New York. Uh, they would have to go through the same uh, uh, the same process as anyone else seeking to get a license, and including passing the driver's test, which was a challenge for me, uh, but uh, it, it, that, it, that is basically it. So we're talking about the standard license um, and un allowing basically un those that are in the state, that are residents of the state, that are undocumented to be able to get a, the standard license. Precisely. Thank you. So Dr. Schoenfeld, um, could you just give us a brief overview of your practice and the kinds of services that you provide to children and families in, on the East End? Sure. Um, I think being so far from the emergency room in an emergency room that doesn't have any pediatric department, pediatric emergency room physicians, we really function both um, in providing primary care but also emergency and urgent care. We are open every day of the year. We have extended 12-hour days, and we're available for night call as well. And we try to ensure the safety and well-being of any child who lives or visits this community. And um, I have devoted my adult life to making sure every child in this community is safe. Great, thanks. So as a health care provider here on the East End, uh, where distances are long between our towns, our villages, our hamlets, um, from one place to the other, what challenges do you see on the East End related to transportation? What challenges do you see particularly in, in your patient population? Well, unfortunately, children tend to get sick and get injured without a plan in place. And when something happens, Everything gets dropped and it needs to be addressed and they need to come to the office to receive help. And 
if they can't do that, it's not safe for the child. And although I care for children, children are very much a part of a family. And if the family cannot provide appropriate care to the child, the child will not do well. So we think it's very important that they be able to access care. Um, one of the things I have noticed in recent years is the frequency with which children are brought to the emergency room in the late evening. And I think that's when they can get a friend or neighbor to get a ride and the care they get and the timing of the care they get is far from ideal. Thanks. So Sandra, as a longtime East Hampton resident, what challenges do you see on the East End related to transportation? Um, I had the challenge um, to drive without a license for nine years. Um, now I do have my driver's license since 2012, seven, I should say, and, but my community have to take the risk more than ever now to drive without a license um, because they have to get to their jobs, they have to bring their children to medical appointments, they have to buy their groceries. So we definitely have to take that chance uh, knowing the risk of at least being fine with uh, tickets, and it's what happened to me mainly when I had to do it. But um, now they have, um, sometimes they get arrest, and uh, sometimes they get their cards impound, and even worse, they are sent to the um, Sobel County Yale in Riverside. That's the major challenges we are facing right now. So you've seen a real shift between a time when if someone was driving without a license locally, they would get a ticket, perhaps, and now the, the consequences are much more dire. They, they are worse now than ever. And uh, moms, that's parents who have children, their children fear for, uh, for their uh, parents um, at night they are thinking, what about if my mom or my dad get arrest while they go to work or they are on the way to um, pick me up? Um, so it's, it's, it's a big difference from then when I came in 19, 1998 uh, and now because it's, it's really important um, to have a, to pass this legislation to support this law and um, allow um, undocumented immigrants to have a license. Thank you. So it's really, it's, it's a community issue, it's a family issue, it's an issue that directly affects children, it directly affects children's health in some cases, and of course the health of the, of the people who are raising the children in our community. Um, so Ms. Layton, what are the particular challenges for the East End business sector related to transportation? You're a small business owner, you've been here a long time, yep. and just speaking from your perspective as a business owner, what do you see as the challenges related to transportation here? Um, I think the challenges are, you know, multifolded. Um, whether you have a legitimate driver's license or not, um, getting to and from, say, work, or getting to the grocery store, or getting to the doctors, or getting to uh, friends or family, wherever it is that you have to go to. Um, the, the buses primarily are, they are scheduled spe only specific times during the day. Oftentimes, you know, I don't even know if they go all the way out to Springs and back to the village. I don't know if they go all the way out to Montauk and back to the village. And the timeliness of them. Can you say a little more about that? Yeah. Um, oftentimes, say if people have to get to work, if they miss the bus, um, then they have to get, you know, call an Uber or call a taxi, which becomes really costly for them. 
So by the time they do get to work or they do get to their doctor's appointments or wherever they're going, people are really stressed out. And I mean, it's, 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 it's not okay. Particularly when it comes to working, you know, oftentimes the bus schedule doesn't allow or the train uh, schedule doesn't allow to accommodate those hours. So then what, what, what happens is whether you're documented or you're not documented, people are stuck. They're just really, really stuck. And it's just not a good situation. Thank you. Minerva, could you talk a little bit about Ola's efforts in relation to transportation, particularly the, the, that one bus line in, in Springs and East Hampton? Um, actually, I'd love to very much because um, Dr. Schoenfeld just shared with me uh, that since the advocacy that Ola got involved with uh, back when we learned that eight bus lines had been cut uh, in Suffolk County Legislature, um, Legislature, that we advocated because we realized that the combination of less bus lines, uh, the buses as it stands stop at about 7 p.m. Uh, the dinner rush in the Hamptons doesn't start until 7 p.m. Uh, and buses that need to get people to work early don't really exist either. Added to that uh, is the fact that there is another level of enforcement that we are seeing, and it is a reality, um, related to driving without a license. So the combination of having less access to public transportation and higher possibilities of enforcement and, and potential linkage to either court or potentially the county jail, that's a really bad situation. So um, Ola's been advocating at, at the county level, at the town level, uh, and now at the state level. Uh, to make sure that we're just looking at the broad range of what it means to have transportation access in the East End for all the reasons that our panelists are discussing. And of course, you know, thinking about not thinking about the, the lack of um, efficient and sufficient public transportation out here, um, but also here on the East End, in a way, we need everyone to be able to drive lawfully more than further west on the island and more than, than New York City, for sure, where they have amazing public transportation. So here people need to get to work. We understand um, how vital um, everyone is to the local economy here, every single resident. And if they can't get to work, uh, then, then it, the local economy suffers. I don't know if anybody would like to comment a little bit more about that. Ms. Gonzalez. Approving this um, um, legislation, or um, when it comes, hopefully into a, a law, um, I think New York State will gain um, big revenue because we um, immigrants work hard and um, we um, have money to invest buying a car and pay for insurance and pay for drivers' education and pay for the um, test to be able to drive. And uh, we can be held accountable if something happened. Uh, we are gonna have safer roads. We are gonna have less accidents. And if in, in that's the case, we can um, be responsible for it. We can be uh, accountable for it. Thank you. Uh just on the economic impact of that, and, and, and it has been stated, uh, you know, we're making efforts for commuter trains, and Bridget Fleming in the county legislature is trying to get bus lines restored. The state budget provided some increased funding to Suffolk County for buses. But in spite of all of those efforts, um, to call public transportation out here spotty uh, would, would, would not maybe do it all justice. We have a long way to go. The fact of the matter is, is, is to be economically self-sufficient on the East End, which we want every person who resides here to be economically self-sufficient, you have to have a car and you have to be able to drive. And for local businesses that need to attract workers, they need, those workers need a way to get to their jobs. So uh, while we, we certainly strive for more public transportation, um, having an automobile, uh, even in this age of climate change, on the East End, having an automobile is still essential. And so for our economic viability out here um, and for the economic self-sufficiency of every resident here, 
you know, this bill is very important. And need I also mention that I just got finished working on the state budget. We could use all those fees that come from the people that would get driver's licenses. We could probably use that, that revenue too. So, uh, you know, part of what I see as important here is, is from an economic point of view, not for the economic self-sufficiency of every individual, but also for the, the, the business community here on, on the East End. You know, um, driving is not no longer a luxury, it's a necessity. And I read some just really interesting statistics um, this morning, um, just based upon uh, economics. Undocumented immigrants in New York pay more than one billion in taxes every single year. I had no idea about that. I mean, that's enormous, enormous. This legislation that we're talking about will make it possible for over 265,000 new drivers to take exams, be issued licenses, which will generate $57 million in annual revenue for the state. That's a lot of money. <laughs> That's a lot of money. It's, it's just simple, smart, common sense legislation. Thank you. It's 57 million, as you said, in combined annual government revenues, and it's 26 million dollars in addition to that in, in one-time revenues, these fees that the Assemblyman was talking about and that Barbara just mentioned. So this is not something that will cost our state money. It will not cost the taxpayers anything. In fact, it will generate revenue for our state so that our state budget could include a lot of great things that we would like it to include. <laughs> Did you want to say anything? Okay. Um, just going back to what Ms. Gonzalez brought up about, about accountability, driver accountability, how important it is to have everyone on the roads driving legally, having valid identification. All of this is very important. So for folks who are concerned about law and order in our communities, uh, and I think that's probably most of us, this is an excellent way to increase law and order by having everyone who is on the road driving have a driver's license, insurance, and a registered vehicle. That is not the case now, as we know, as we've been, as we've been discussing. Uh, so to have that would be, would be excellent. Um, I wanted to go back to you, Dr. Schoenfeld, to talk about, so it's, it's a public safety issue, right? The, the more drivers on the road who are insured um, and with registered vehicles and who can be identified with valid identification, this is um, all good for public safety. And I also wanted to ask you just about the community health issue in general um, and in relation to public safety. Well, it's interesting in the state of New York, um, up until your 18th birthday, your 19th birthday, the end of your 18th year, um, you are entitled to health insurance no matter who you are. Um, but adults, it's a very different story. And um, children have huge additional guaranteed uh, rights to health care. They have not only guaranteed access to Medicaid and Child Health Plus, depending on their income, um, mandated vaccinations and routine preventative health care, um, but a package of 10 different um, uh, types of health care that um, have to be covered um, by the ACA um, for all children. Um, the adults often uh, don't get any health care. They don't have health insurance. They cannot afford health care. They do not have access um, by any means. They can't afford their medications. They can't afford their lab tests. And they certainly can't afford the hospital. And that kind of hesitancy to seek care for lack of ability to pay for it um, it's very expensive because in the long run, people wait too long and it is much more expensive to care for them. Um, the physical access, the transportation access is, I think, um, the least of their problems out here. Although it 
is a concern for families, as you were saying earlier, that they can't get their children to care quickly enough sometimes and, and to the kind of care you provide in your office, for example, versus very late night uh, emergency care, perhaps. And if we want to talk about economics, a trip to the emergency room will cost five to 10 times as much to the healthcare system, which, most of which is being paid by the state of New York, than a trip to my office would and probably not be um, as, um, as of highest standard and quality for the child. Uh, one thing I did want to share that I kind of got off topic is that um, as a result of some of the county level advocacy that we we're doing regarding buses, uh, meeting with Gail and uh, Dr. Schoenfeld and learning that uh, from her and her staff that it was taking about three hours to get from Springs uh, to the Panago Road healthcare facility one way, two buses and I think a transfer meant that people were not having the access they needed to the services, not only at, with Dr. Schoenfeld's office, but every other doctor that's at the Panago Road Healthcare facility, which is a number of doctors. Um, so the, a, a nice story around this was that um, it, it, your help and sharing uh, the lack of access was able to kind of free up a lot of attention for Bridget Fleming to work uh, in, in combination with um, the planning department at East Hampton to shave off some of the time that a bus was, the bus going to the uh, lighthouse um, so that we could have another bus run a circuit around Springs and get to the healthcare facility. And what Gail just shared with me a little bit earlier today was that that was so successful that, that there was now a second bus that is doing that. So the need is great. Um, the, that advocacy at that level with buses worked to a degree, but I think it's also an example of that's still where the need is. So that's still an hour and a half one-way trip. So it went from three hours to an hour and a half. And, uh, and definitely represented better access to healthcare, and it's being used in that regard as well. So it's, it's tough because you, you know that the need is there. We're meeting with people constantly. We have Alma here, uh, who is our transportation advocate. Ola has committed to offering free rides to medical appointments for adults and for children. We are taking people to their cancer treatments. We're taking kids to their doctor visits, to their therapy visits. We're taking folks that have had workers' comp accidents that have no other access to transportation to the doctor and back again. So we, uh, and these are many, many trips that we're doing throughout the month uh, with a donated van and one person doing the trips or motiv uh, mobilizing our volunteer efforts. Uh, the need is great. I did want to share a little anecdote. Um, I guess it was two summers ago we had a Hispanic woman come to the office. She took the bus to Newtown Lane and then she walked in the pouring rain with her two-week-old and two-year-old to the office. The two-week-old had a very serious infection, um, which fortunately she recognized and had the fortitude to make the trip. And one of the summer uh, residents stopped on the road and picked her up, brought her to the office, and stayed in the office during her appointment to bring her back because he was so concerned about the welfare of the child. And after that, um, we did a survey in our office asking all of our patients if they had transportation problems limiting their access to the office and really documented how big a problem it really is out here. Thank you, Thank you for that. That's, that's really important. Ms. Gonzalez? No? <laughs> um, I just, I wanted to ask you actually to share um, just if you know of any stories like that in, you know, within the immigrant community, not necessarily related to healthcare, but just stories of, of people getting into trouble because they are doing what they have to, to, to live everyday life, whether it's get their children to, to school or get the, themselves to work or pick kids up from sports practice or go to the library or go to, to, to worship on Sunday. Um, if you have any experience or, um, uh, you know, observing what is happening in our community. Yes, I have um, too many ex too many stories, and I can tell also my personal story. I refrain refrain from driving um, 
for about four years. I did not want to drive without a license, but um, in November 2002, I decided to do it because I almost get frost on my way to work um, as a um, nanny in a house in East Hampton. Uh, the first years, um, I walk in the snow to get to my job um, in Amagansett when I live in East Hampton. Um, I have friends who, um, my best friend was arrested, and um, my other friend also got her car um, impound and she couldn't um, drive no longer. Uh, um, my first, my friend, um, the, the first um, friend I met here, her two children, have um, post-traumatic stress disorder because um, the mom um, was in trouble. Um, she was arrested and um, sent to jail, and it was uh, a whole process to uh, get her free, and uh, so her children have to live with the fear of um, wonder what's, what was going to happen with the mom. But um, luckily, she just obtained her um, legal um, status uh, two weeks ago after waiting 25 years for it. Because it's a long road to um, get it. It's not easy for everybody. So it's... Um, some of the experience I can tell, um, and that's why I'm here to um, tell the importance to allow us to obtain um, driver's license for all. Thank you. Regardless of our immigration status. Thank you. Minerva and then Barbara. I wanted to share um, the population that Sandra and I both have experience with, um, victims of domestic violence. Uh, I did run the Retreats Domestic Violence Shelter for six years, and I got to work with Sandra there. Um, what we saw was that any impediment to creating a safety plan for a victim of domestic violence, whether they are a man, a woman, whether they're documented or not, is critical to have. And... Um, in any way that that could be obtained, that's going to be another way to safety. And um, there are, it's just another population uh, that, we, that we saw um, in, in dire need, um, no access to real transportation, other, you know, not really no transportation, uh, so that if this were possible, there's a whole other population, and we know how large that population is and how that cuts across all different strata, economic strata, um, so I think that's uh, something that we also share uh, in terms of yeah, need. Thank you. And I think the story that you shared, Ms. Gonzalez, is, is so important because it again takes us back to this issue that we're not just talking about licenses. We're not just talking about access to transportation. We're talking about um, a public safety issue and a community health issue. We don't need children traumatized in our community because their mother was picked up for driving without a license and then sent to jail. That's, those are the connections that, that are so important to keep in mind here. Um, Ms. Layton. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to add that it is a safety issue on every level, um, physically, mentally, emotionally, um, for sure. We, you know, this is a reality right now. We can't sit back and wait for Congress to come up with a comprehensive plan to address immigration. We have to, you know, take measures right now to ensure safety for all of us on every level. I mean, you know, I read another thing this morning. Unlicensed drivers are five times more likely to have a fatal accident than not. I mean, that's, that's crazy. It's pretty outrageous. So, yeah, let's do what we need to do now. And just piggybacking on what you said, and that's such an important um, um, piece of information, in states that have passed um, legislation allowing access to driver's licenses to the undocumented, and that those are 12 states, 12 other states have done this. And think about New York's history as 
the welcoming state to immigrants. Think about the Statue of Liberty. Think of what this state really stands for historically. And the fact that we do not um, have this access um, available to our undocumented population is, is really quite, quite remarkable. Uh, in states where this legislation has been passed, the number of uninsured drivers has plummeted mm -hmm. when this law is, has passed. So, for example, in New Mexico, the un rate of uninsured drivers, the percentage was 33%, and after passing a law that allowed the undocumented to drive, only 9% of drivers were uninsured. And of course, not necessarily immigrants, but lots of people are driving around uninsured. In Utah, 28% down to 9% after passing legislation that, that allowed access to driver's licenses. And I also just want to say that back in the 90s, I'm not sure I'm going to remember the exact year, maybe 1993, all states in the United States allowed undocumented immigrants to have access to driver's licenses. But since 1993, that has been rolled back, rolled back, bit by bit by bit, chipped away at, state by state. Until now, we're back in the process of building it all back and putting it back together with common sense legislation like we have in the Assembly and, and in, the, in the Senate right now. So I think we're going to wrap up the discussion and allow some questions from the audience. I would just like um, to say, uh, to ask Assemblyman Thiel to say, why is it that you are a co-sponsor of this bill? And first of all, thank you for being a co-sponsor of the bill, but why did you jump on to this early on? Yes. Well, funny you should ask that question. The, the prime sponsor of the legislation, his name is Marcos Crespos. He's from, an Assemblyman from the Bronx, and he uh, sponsored this legislation for the last couple of years, and, and uh, as soon as he introduced it, I signed on as a co-sponsor, and he and I are friends. We, we share this passion also for the New York Mets and talk about that once in a while, which is a real character builder, by the way, um, <laughs> but, but we've become close friends. But he came up to me and said, are you sure you want to sponsor this bill? He saw my name on it. And because he knows, he, you know, I, again, we all have our stereotypes. And I think his was, well, he represents one of those districts on Long Island, and it's a wealthier district, and it's primarily, you know, the perception out here, by the way, of the Hamptons, it's the lifestyles and the rich and famous. So it's part of my job as a legislator to educate people what, what, how diverse this district actually is. But, um, you know, and I, I said, I'm sure I want to be on your bill. And, you know, it... it First of all, I think with this issue or the DREAM Act, uh, which, we, which, which were passed and was included as part of the, uh, of the state budget this year, uh, as was stated, we on the state level have no control over uh, immigration policy. That's, that's a federal issue. Uh, the federal government has failed us time and again as far as immigration reform, but we have to address the consequences of that policy. And I think as, as a elected member of the legislature, it's extremely important not to get sucked into the vortex of division that uh, many in public life are attempting to create with immigration, but really to address each and one of these issues, whether it's education or driver's licenses, on the merits. And to me, uh, the merits of this are public, first of all, an individual's right to be self-sufficient, but for my district, the issue of public safety, which has been me mentioned already, having the roads be safer. We, we've all picked up a copy of the local paper because, you know, one of the, the most popular columns uh, and or articles every week, whether it's the Star or the Independent or the Sag Harbor Express, people love to read the police blotter. And, and uh, you, you will see uh, you know, the number of unlicensed drivers, unregistered drivers, accidents with un unlicensed drivers. Uh, to me, number one, the merits are about public safety, about individual self-sufficiency, and about the local economy. Um, and uh, that really was the basis of deciding that really this was a no-brainer for this. And and, you know, we have 70 sponsors now in the Assembly. There's, there's substantial support for this bill in the Assembly. 
And, uh, you know, we expect that there's going to be a vote on this bill. When we, we, we go back on April 29th, and we're there to the end of June, you know, somewhere between April 29th and June 19th, I expect that there's going to be a vote on this bill. Thank you, Assemblyman Thiel. And I'll just say, um, to echo that, again, those numbers are very important. Uh, or you can Google them and, and write them. Um, uh, one of our partners and co-sponsors, uh, Progressive East End Reformers, is uh, passing out green cards that you can also send, you can fill out, and, and they will take care of delivering them to the, the correct folks. So please just keep this in mind. And the ask... What we want is for these leaders of the two houses to bring this legislation to a vote this session. That is what we're asking for. Bring it to a vote this session. So that's all you got to call up and say to them. It's, it's painless, trust me. Um, and, and what Fred th said as well, I just want to say that in California, New Mexico, and Utah, studies have shown that road safety improved with fewer hit and run accidents and fewer traffic fatalities after this legislation was passed in those states. So not only did the, the percentage of uninsured drivers go down, but road safety went up in these states. Ms. Perez. I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that, please, uh, we would love to see your questions. John is walking around gathering question cards. If you could just hold them up in the air, if you've written a question, please hold them up in the air, the question cards themselves, and John will collect them. Anyone else that's missing? Uh, there's one over here, John. One right over there. You want to grab that? Or Blanca? You want to grab that? Uh, okay. You just cut right through. While we're fine. waiting for the questions, would anybody like to add anything that you haven't had a chance to add? Yeah. Ms. Uh, you know, I, was, uh, I wasn't sure I was going to make it tonight, and I'm happy that I did. And um, as I was coming back, I was coming back from a, uh, a funeral um, in the city, and I just started, jotted down a few, uh, a few thoughts that I had that I thought was so appropriate for this, this topic, this moment. Um, so bear with me. It's, it's, it's very quick, but um, I wanted to share it with all of you. Um, we are at a critical turning point, bordering on a critical tipping point. The challenges before us at this time are complicated and serious, calling forth for a completely new way, not only of tackling, tackling them, but a completely new way of seeing them. Buckminster Fuller so aptly put it when he said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. The thinking that brought us to this point in time cannot be the same thinking to move us forward in a coherent way. The fact that we are waking up and yearning for something different is a good thing. If you're not depressed, something is very wrong with you. <laughs> but staying optimistic at the same time. As we see in our own community and across the world, the view of us and them me or you, is not, nor has ever been, sustainable. We can only move forward together, for divided we truly fall. And at the end of the day, when all is said and done, are our differences that much greater than that what truly connects us to our humanity? So I think that's really the context, part of the context of everything that we're talking about right now. So how to build a stronger community, how to build a more unified community, how to build a safer community. I think this is what um, Ms. Leighton is getting at. So while we're waiting on the questions, um, I, Senator Luis Sepulveda, who is the author of this bill in the Senate, in the New York State Senate, there was some possibility that he might be here tonight, but he's coming from very far away. He re represents a district very far away. So he did send a statement that, that uh, I would like to read because it kind of sums up the main issues that we've been talking about tonight. Senator Sepulveda says, Good evening to everyone. While I sincerely regret not being able to join you tonight, I commend you all for gathering on this important issue. It is these types of conversations that make our communities stronger. The Green Light Bill, known as a Driver's License Access and Privacy Act, presents an incredible opportunity for our state to improve road safety, generate economic growth, and live up to our shared values. 
It will create millions of dollars in increased revenues, lower insurance premiums, and spur local economic booms, especially in rural areas. We are semi-rural out here on the East End, aren't we? I can assure you that law enforcement will continue to have all means necessary to keep our roads and communities safe. And officials in other US states with the policy have already recognized the improvements in traffic safety. I am proud to be the lead Senate sponsor on this bill, which will ensure our communities live in greater safety, dignity, and prosperity. Thank you for your engagement, and don't hesitate to reach out to my office. Senator Luis Sepulveda. Thank you, John. So let's start. And I think with the questions, there's the mic. I'll share my mic, and people just jump in as they like. Can ICE or Department of Homeland Security access in any way the DMV database for standard licenses? Who would like to? Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, the question is, if, perhaps, is if, if this bill is enacted, will they be able to? And if you notice, the title of the bill is Driver's License Access and Privacy Act. Uh, so the, the, the privacy part of this uh, is also included in the bill. We, we really haven't touched upon that. But there are provisions in the legislation that would preclude ICE and those kinds of enforcement organizations from accessing uh, this, this information that would be in the state's database. And for local law enforcement? Same thing. And just to clarify that point, um, because there is a lot of misinterpretation, and since it has been brought up in, the, in a question, local law enforcement will be able to do their jobs exactly as they do it now, do their jobs now. So they do not have access to the entire DMV database at this point, and they will not have access to the t entire DMV da um, database. What they are able to do if I get stopped for anything, they are able to run my name to get information and background information on me related to my driving record and, and criminal record and things like that. Um, I don't think I have one, but <laughs> you never know. <laughs> uh, but they do not have access to the entire DMV database, so that will not change. They will still be able to stop someone, check that person's name in, in the database, but only that person's name. Did anyone else want to comment on this? I wanted to add one thing to that only, mm -hmm. uh, sorry. Um, that what they have the ability to do now, law enforcement, is if they did have an, an inquiry or they're doing an investigation on someone, they could subpoena for more information. Uh, they have access to that right now and they would have that with this license as well. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. So the next question. If someone with a license who is an undocumented resident is charged with a ve vehicular crime, such as driving while intoxicated, are there any ramifications past the standard legal and DMV ones for the standard license? So I think the question is, if, 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 this, if this legislation is enacted mm -hmm. and the standard license is restored, access is restored to undocumented undoc people, does this endanger the undocumented person in any way beyond what the standard legal and DMV pr proceedings are? Is that, does anybody want to address this? Yeah. And again, I think the answer is the same as my, my first answer, and that is uh, obviously uh, if you commit uh, an offense uh, while driving, you're going to be liable for that. There, you know, with the privilege of driving comes the responsibility of driving. But I, my understanding, again, because of the privacy provisions, is that it would not uh, um, uh, put, put you in a position where you'd be uh, liable for, for anything else or susceptible to any, anything else. But you, you certainly would, you know, have, if it related to your driving record and your driver's license, you certainly are, are responsible there. But even as it stands now, if someone were undocumented uh, driving and driving drunk and caught, uh, there is still accountability for that person right now. So um, it, it, there's accountability kind of across the board, yeah. yeah. What are the main arguments people make against undocumented immigrants driving li uh, having driver's licenses, aside from fear of terrorists getting licenses? Who would like to address this? 
Ms. Gonzalez? All I can say is we are not terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent answer. <laughs> But what? I, but it, it, that's important to note. But also, wh why people? Why people would be opposed to this common sense, practical public safety legislation? Yeah, I, oh, sure. Um, I, again, I, I think I said at one point when considering this legislation, it's not. It, it's it's important not to get sucked into the politics of division that has surrounded immigration, and that's largely where the opposition comes from. Uh, the, 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 uh, the opposition will argue that the, the right to drive is a privilege, and if you are not in this country legally, you should not be granted that privilege, that that is something that you should have only if you are here, uh, you're documented or you have, um, um, or, you, or you're a citizen. I mean, that, that, that's the argument. That's the argument against the DREAM Act. That's the argument against DACA. That's the argument against anything with immigration. And it's the same argument over and over and over again. Ms. Lee. And I just want to add that, you know, laws and regulations based upon fear are absolutely not sustainable. It's just impossible. Thank you. This is a question for the Assemblyman. Which Long Island Senators do you think are most likely to move to support? So just to be clear, we, we need more support in the Senate, uh, not so much in the Assembly, uh, where we're kind of where we need to be, but in the Senate we do need support. So which Long Island Senators are, are most likely to move? Um, well, first of all, just to, uh, just to you know, follow up on what you said. I, I, I do feel comfortable about passage of this bill in, in the assembly. We have a, a much greater margin for error, <laughs> as it were. I, I think that, uh, you know, we have the support of the speaker. Uh, we have 70 co-sponsors. Uh, the, the focus of, of attention, I really think, does need to be on the Senate. Uh, and I think that um, on the Senate side, uh, I would, uh, I think there's a, a lot of focus on suburban legislators, whether they be Long Island, the Hudson Valley, um, you know, sub suburban senators in, you know, around New York City. Um, you know, the real answer to your question is that I wouldn't write off anybody. I think whether they're, they're, they're Democratic or Republican or they're from Long Island or they're from Elmira or they're from Buffalo or they're from Plattsburgh, you should go and lobby each and every one of them. Um, and find out where they stand and why. Uh, in particular, I think that majority senators, Democratic senators uh, from Long Island and the lower Hudson Valley were, would be senators I would sp spend particular attention lobbying. I think they're the, those senators are the difference between victory and defeat on this legislation. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't bring my directory with me, uh, but, you know, it, you know, in Suffolk County, you have Senator Monica Martinez, who I think supports this bill uh, already, but Senator Gorin, uh, Senator Brooks, uh, you know, the Long Island senators, they, it used to be the Long Island Nine. All nine senators used to be Republican. They used to call them the Long Island Nine. Now there's six Democrats. They call them the Six Pack. Um, so... Uh, those six Long Island Democratic senators in particular, I would focus a lot of attention on to see where they stand. And I'll just echo that. Uh, the, the Green Light New York coalition that Ola is a part of and has been a part of for many, many months, um, that is also what, what the coalition, and it's a statewide coalition, but the coalition is stressing, stressing that these six Long Island Democratic senators are key. Monica Mart Martinez is one of them. Todd Kaminsky is another key senator. And if you want all of the names, um, we have posted those on, on social media and in other places, but please uh, just let Minerva or me know, um, and we can make sure that we get all of the information to you to contact senators further west. Um, okay, so what advice can you offer if I get in a car accident with an undocumented immigrant? I don't want to call the police because I don't want the person to get deported. <laughs> That's why you're taking it. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Well, I mean, depending upon the level of accident, uh, if it is uh, something where there's, you're not going to the hospital, so take one thing at a time. Um, if you've got damage to your vehicle, um, I think in terms of gathering the information on that person, them knowing that if you don't want to call the police first, that there is going to be a way that you get payment. Um, I'm going to throw something really crazy out there, and our lawyer in the house is probably going to kill me for this one. Where are you, Andrew? Um, but I'm going to say, if that does happen, and you're living in the five East End towns, I'm going to say, also call Ola. I'm not saying I'm going to pay your bills for that, but I'm going to say that if it means that you are willing to have that conversation and see if that payment can be made with that individual, I would rather help to make that happen for you um, than you feel like you're on your own as a person who just got in an accident and that you're going to be a good guy and walk away and pay for everything that just happened. Okay, So that's, that's about uh, stuff. That's about uh, material loss or, or damage to your bumper or something like that. Um, in terms of something greater than that, if you're suffering an accident because someone was drinking and driving, uh, then you call the police. People should not be drinking and driving, period. So I'm going to put that in two levels. Have you lost stuff that can be replaced? And if so, I will personally do everything I can to make sure that you're not walking away with absolutely anything at all. I'll do everything I possibly can. If you are injured as a result of someone's bad driving or drunk driving, call the police. You're not doing anyone any good by trying to protect someone who's driving drunk. So that's my answer. I um, want to point this. Um, we uh, or people drive without a license, but uh, we don't drive without insurance. We have a network of family, relatives, of uh, good friends who get insurance for us. So if you are involved in an accident, and make sure with the person um, they, uh, to call the insurance because uh, we do have insurance. So if you don't want to call police, it's going to be appreciated, but definitely um, both insurance can deal with um, the accident, yours or the person involved in the accident. Thank you. I wanted to also add that by not um, supporting this bill, we are supporting a rather vibrant uh, black market of sort of nefarious um, sources that are, that are getting uh, certain things done in a way that they shouldn't be getting done. Uh, going through family is one thing that's not nefarious. Um, but there are other people out there, uh, there's a black market, um, and it's thriving as a result, as, as we know that that, that happens. And so uh, this is another way to make sure that we're cutting those folks kind of out of um, sort of helping to run our state. Uh, we'll take two more questions, and then I think we'll wrap things up. So I'm going to read these questions in Spanish because they came to me in Spanish, but I will also read them in English. ¿Cree usted que los inmigrantes tendrán más riesgos a ser deportados al tener toda la información de cada uno en las licencias? Do you think that immigrants are more at risk of being deported if all their information can be found through their license? I think um, this is a point you made before, but I think it bears repeating just so people feel assured. Um, there you go, Solomon. The way the bill is written is, is to, as I said, it's driver access and privacy, and it is to that that information that is given to the state of New York, that the state of New York will ensure that your privacy is maintained and that that information does not end up in the hands of ICE or... Uh, other law enforcement agencies. It's expressly stated in the bill. Exactly. And I can say that with confidence that OLA as an organization would not be a part of co the coalition, would not be uh, pushing for support of this bill if we weren't assured and confident that, that these privacy stipulations are in place to protect our community. Uh, the final question is for you, Assemblyman. ¿Qué lo motiva usted um, a involucrarse con esta idea? What or how did you get involved with this Greenlight New York, and what, what motivated you? So you've talked about the kind of practical reasons, but maybe do you have any more personal reasons for I do. supporting this? Uh, I, I do, not just for the issue of driver's licenses, but uh, for the DREAM Act, for all the issues that uh, involve uh, important members of our community, a critical part of our community, uh, 
that's constitutive of, of uh, immigrants, undocumented in immigrants. And, um, you know, I've been an elected official for a long time, uh, but what really made this issue for me um, and why I take the positions that I take over and over again with regard to immigration w w was rather personal. And, and uh, I'm 60, I'm now Medicare eligible. I'm 65. Um, so. Congratulations. Yeah. So I, but, but I, as time goes on, I end up spending more and more time going to the pharmacy. So, um, so I go to the pharmacy in Sag Harbor. There was always a, a young man that worked there. Um, who was just out of high school, he was in his early 20s. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd get my prescription and, you know, buy a few things. And, you know, we, we'd chat each other up and talk with each other. And, um, you know, we, we got to know each other fairly well. And you, you looked at the kid, you talked to the kid, you listened to, you know, the, the, the culture. You, you, American is apple pie, okay? And one day he came up to me, you know, because he, you know, he got to know that I was a member of the state assembly. And he says, you know, I'm a dreamer. Um, I was brought here when I was four or five years old. And this is a kid that, uh, just really a great kid, smart as a whip, wanted to be a police officer. That was his dream. And of course, under the circumstances, can't be. But uh, you know, un under DACA, was able. You know, I, I helped him with his DACA application. And Just to clarify, DACA is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which was a policy that the Obama administration um, uh, established. So, and you know, he's he's going on. He is uh, he does work for the police department. He's he's involved with. Uh, uh, with with uh, the, the ambulance company, he's uh, you know emergency EMS, all of that. He's been able to do that, um, but he, to me, he was uh, living proof that um, um, you know we should be doing uh, our, our government should be on the side of of of, of uh, real and, and should realize that. What an what assets uh, the immigration the immigrant population is to our community and to our country. So that's my kind of personal story, and and uh, you know that was many years ago. He's uh, you know he's married. He's got a family here. He's doing pretty well, but um, you, you know there are still limits on what he can do because of the failed immigration policy we have on the federal level. So I do what I can do on the state level. And here locally, and we appreciate it. Those are all of our questions. And again, I want to thank you all for being here tonight. And please give a, a round of applause to our panelists, our excellent panelists. I just want to close my participation tonight saying, please um, help us to pass this legislation and I did not come um, here driving without a license. This, <laughs> this means life or almost life or death for our community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Gonzalez. Thank you all. Thank you.